Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to be taking a look at installing plugins, so instruments and effects. This video is the first in a pair where we're going to be looking at doing it on Windows. In the next video it will be in Mac OS. They're very similar but they're not the same and I think it's important to differentiate and make it simple to, to see what the differences are. So this is Windows only, the next one will be Mac OS. Now a lot of people aren't aware that there's a huge range of plugins instruments and effects which you can get for free. So sometimes these are reduced feature versions and then you can pay for the full version. Sometimes they're just things that people have written, etc. But it can massively expand your sonic palette, say whether it's instruments or effects. And there's a whole load of really, really useful, interesting stuff, possibly not replacement for all uh, commercial plugins, but there's a lot of stuff which is every bit as good. And if you haven't got the money, then it's great to be able to get all these things for free. But the installation is something that can be beyond some people, so there's there's some technicalities to it, and you want to know the right way to do it. So we're going to be looking at that, looking at the three different ways that you can install them. So typically, they will either come as an installer, as a VST2 file, or a VST3 file. So we're going to cover all three of those in their own sections. Uh, very briefly, plugins today generally are all 64-bit so there are some legacy 32-bit plugins but for good technical reasons Cubase moved I think at version 9.5 to only using 64-bit plugins and that was a bit of a difficult time because it was you had to kiss goodbye to some old legacy things but it's it's definitely been a huge improvement in terms of system stability and the capacity of plugins because 64-bit plugins and a 64-bit program have a, a much, much bigger uh, memory capacity, whereas a 32-bit system or a 32-bit program is limited, and that genuinely was a problem. So we're only looking at 64-bit plugins. Um, there are some reasons possibly to use bridged 32-bit plugins, but that's going to be a topic for another video. So let's get into it first by looking at installing using an installer. So here you can see I'm in Windows Explorer and I've got the file that I've downloaded from Voxengo. So Voxengo makes some great plugins. Uh, they give away some free ones as well. I think it's important to support people who do this kind of thing. So if you like the free one, look at getting the paid one. They're generally pretty low cost. So this is a typical installer. This is the simplest of the installations. But as you can see here, we've got a lot of choices in here because it's the Windows 32 or 64 bit version. It's got VST2, VST3 and AAX. So this is something where you might want to make the right choices and we will look at what those are. So here running the program, typical, accept the agreement. And then in the next page, we get these choices here. So you can see they've pre-selected some things here. So here I'm going to make a choice which uh, you, they, you may or may not agree with, but this is the, the way that I like to do it. So if you're given the option of VST3, then I would just install the VST3 one because it makes life simpler. If you only get the choice of VST2, which is kind of abbreviated to VST, then just do that. But there's no point in installing both. So if you get both, as you can see here, I would untick that one. But also notice that by default, they've unticked the 32-bit ones and you wouldn't want them. Now, I also would never install the Pro Tools version because I no longer use Pro Tools. So I'm going to untick that because I don't want those files on here for no reason. So all I'm installing in this case is a VST3 because that, for me, is the best option. Then I'm just going to click Next. Just get Program Group as typical and then Install. Here's a project with a stereo track with a sample from Media Bay loaded in. And in the insert section here, I can call up the plugin I've just installed by typing ANS for ANSPEC and then loading that there. And there we can see it. And you can see that running and it works perfectly. And that would be the case for any other. You may need to launch it as an instrument track, obviously, if it's an instrument. If you take the choice to only install a VST3 plugin, then it means you won't have to provide any path for where the plugins need to go. If you choose a VST2 plugin, then you would need to put it in the right place. And we're going to look at that in the next section on VST2 plugin installation. So, next up, 
VST2. So here we're going to go effectively a bit old school because a couple of years ago now, Steinberg stopped new developers being able to create VST2 plugins. So they're, they're pretty much legacy plugins now, even if they are 64-bit. But there's still quite a few of them going around. I believe it's still possible for an existing developer to create a plugin or update their plugin. Not exactly sure. Haven't looked into that too much. But definitely, they are ultimately a thing of the past. They're one of the reasons why it's not been possible to create an open source version of Short Circuit, for instance, which was uh, an interesting thing. So that's going to need to be updated to VST3, and there are technical reasons why that's difficult. Anyway, they generally come as a DLL file, as we'll see here. But the key with this is putting them in the right place. So that's what we're going to look at. So here you can see I've downloaded Fury 800, which is a VST. And if I extract these, so I'm just going to right click and then just do extract all. And then here we can see inside the Fury folder, we've got a few different files to look at. Fortunately, you can see that this one is the 32-bit one because this one says Fury 864. So this is the one that we're going to install. There are other files included here. So we've got the license and the release notes and the manual. And you may want to put those somewhere you want. Sometimes you will get plugins where there are extra files with them as well. And depending on the plugin, you may need to put those in the right place. Generally, it would be in the same folder as you put the plugin into. But sometimes they are specific about them. Again, you need to read the instructions. So here we come to something which is possibly a little non-standard, but it's a system that works well for me. So I've got two folders that I've created myself, one of them for free plugins and one of them for paid plugins. So all of the free plugins live in one folder and all of the plugins that I've bought live in another folder. There's two reasons for this. Firstly is if I ever have an unstable system, which doesn't happen so much now, but used to back in the day, I could just disable the free plugin folder as typically it would be something in there that was the problem. Um, the other reason is, is providing you're not breaking any licensing conditions, it means that if you have a friend who wants some plugins, you can just give them your whole free plugin folder. You don't need to worry that maybe you're accidentally giving them a paid plugin and, you know, breaking the law, etc. Most free plugins you can redistribute yourself, but not all of them. So you'll need to just make sure you're not doing anything you shouldn't be doing. But often you can just copy those and send them to whoever needs them. And this can be really useful because you can build up a, a big collection of them and know that you can just give those away. Looking here, you can see I've got two folders here. I've got my free plugins folder and my paid plugins folder. So let's go into the free plugins folder. And we can see I've put some folders in here as well because VST2 plugins are presented in the folders that you put them in by default. And I would call the Fury 800 an emulating synth. So I'm going to go into there. And there we can see is the place where I need to put it. And we can see I've got a couple of other ones. So the K1V and the Forefront Piano and some retro things which simulate things like SID chips, etc. So they're a bit you know, weird and old school. So now I'm just going to copy that 864 file and then paste that into here. So that's step one of the process. You can rename them. So these generally will be the names that they appear in your system. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rename that and call it Fury 800 X64. So it's just a little easier to see. And the X64 means that it's a 64 bit plugin. So I don't get confused. So next, you need to tell Cubase to use the folder that you've set up and put some free plugins in. So in this case, I've got two folders which I've I've added, my paid and my free ones, but the, the system is the same. Now, the reason for using this rather than the default ones is because the default ones can vary depending on which operating system you're on and also the history of Cubase installations on there. So I've, I've found it's not particularly consistent and it was much easier just to say, here's a folder I've made, here's where the plugins are, I'm going to set Cubase to use those and then we're done. But also, as I mentioned earlier, it means if you want to just disable those free plugins, you can do that. And if you want to move them to another machine, you can do that as well. So here we are in Cubase and the key to making Cubase, look at that, is fairly straightforward. So we go to Studio and then we go to VST Plugin Manager 
And this section here at the bottom may not be visible, so you may need to click the little cog here. But once it is, this is all the locations that Cubase is looking in. And as you can see at the bottom, you've got these. So these are the default locations. And you can see there's four of them, which is one of the reasons why it can be a bit confusing as to where they are. Here's my paid plugins one, which is already added. And I'm going to add the free plugins one just by clicking plus and then going to the location in question. So S drive, VST plugins free. I'm going to select folder and you can see that's been added now. So we've got paid and then we've got free at the bottom there. Once you've done that, you need to rescan the plugins. They won't appear straight away. Now you can rescan them in the plugin manager, but I've generally found that it works better if you do it just by restarting Cubase because you get to see the process. So we'll actually see it scanning those plugins at the bottom of the Cubase splash screen as it launches. So here I'm going to close Cubase and then rerun it. And we'll see, it might do it too quick to see it, but it will scan those plugins. You'll see VST2 plugin manager. And we're done. It scanned all those. And now we can create an instrument track with the Fury 800 X64. And there it is in all its glory, ready to take us back to school in the 80s. So that's it for VST2 plugins. Now, creating a folder structure inside your plugins folder and putting them in the right place uh, can be worthwhile because then if you need to browse for a particular kind of plugin, you can do that, although I find I'm often searching by name because generally I know which plugin I'm after, but occasionally the name escapes me, etc. And just being able to look in a folder inside the new plugin window makes it a little easier to find possibilities to, to change it slightly or pick something a bit different. Next up, the newest standard, VST3 plugins, which you'll be relieved to know are a little simpler to install. So here we have Lith. Now, as you can see, Lith is available in two different formats. We can be in VST or VST3. So we're going to install the VST3 one. And again, just going to extract all of these. So there's one thing on Windows, which is a bit annoying. If you double click this, it will just open it up without extracting the files, which can lead to issues later on. So it's, it's just generally easier just to extract all because then you know things aren't going to go wrong. So here we are, and we can see we've got just this lith.vst3 file, and you'll see it with this kind of cube. Now, this needs to go into a different location than the one we've seen previously. Unfortunately, there is a pretty universal standard for this, so they seem to all be in the same place rather than possibilities which happen with vst2. So I'm going to copy this, and then I'm going to go to the folder in question, which is C... Program files, common files, VST3. Now in here, I've got a few options so you can see all the paid plugins, but in fact, I've created a free folder for the same reasons as earlier. So I'm going to put them in there and then I'm just going to paste Lith in there. And that's it. So here we are in Cubase and again, I'm going to create a new instrument track and search for Lith by just typing the name there. And as you can see, it's not only there, but also it's VST3. That's what these three little stripes mean. And we can open up its user interface and see that Lith is there and ready to play. So there you have it. A guide to installing plugins on Windows, whether it's with an installer or a VST2 DLL file or a VST3.VST3 file. So hopefully that will open up a world of being able to install and experiment with a wide range of free and low-cost plugins, which otherwise don't come with the kind of support that you'd get with larger commercial offerings. As ever, hope you found this video useful. If you have, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition.